Hello Grace Kids Church, um, this is Priscilla here, I've got some few friends here with me as well. Um, we just want to say thank you for sending your pictures through um, of the ones with the, you and God at your favourite place. Um, I just want to show you some few photo, uh, pictures that we actually got. So this lovely pictures from, from Phoebe, thank you Phoebe. We have another one from, this is from Isaac. Thank you for that, Isaac. And another lovely one from Daniel. So thank you for that, Daniel. And um, we've got some few here as well from Rain. Rain, do you want to tell us about your picture? I have me and Jesus standing on the clouds and I have my rainbow beautifully neat and good. Oh, beautiful work, Ray. Thank you. We have another one here from Melody as well. Melody, can you tell us about where you find yourself in God? I put some few friends and my sister in it too. So I have Jesus, Rain, my best friend Lillian and myself playing soccer. And there's a beautiful shiny sun too. Oh, very nice. Thank you um, for that, Melody. Um, Lion, you've got your photo as well, haven't you? Do you want to show everyone your photo? This is Jesus, this is me, and that's Jesus. Oh, that is wonderful, Lion. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, this is a great way to get everyone involved in um, just, you know, the fellowshipping with God. And especially not being together, but just know that we are praying for you guys and we're praying for one another as well. Again, there will be another special thing that you will have to look for in the videos. Um, it's called Mr. Smiley. So watch out for Mr. Smiley in the next few videos. And you have to count how many Mr. Smiley faces you can, um, you can find in, a vi in that video coming up. Okay? So, um, and then obviously you send it to us as well. Okay? So we look forward to seeing you all or well, hearing from you. And praying, seeing you all very soon as well. All right, stay blessed. Bye. Bye. We love your Bye. pictures. Bye. Bye. See you later. Bye. We'll just take an opportunity now to pray for our nation. To uphold our nation, Father, before you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for this land and the people, Lord. Glorious Father, you know us all. You know each one of us. You know our heart and our mind. You know our comings and our goings, Lord. Father, may you be with us in all our ways. And may you lead us, Lord. May we know Christ, our Saviour, and his redemption, Father. The Saviour. The salvation of Christ through the redemption of his blood, Father. May this be given to the people of this land, Father. May we be known by the name of Jesus. May we be set apart unto you, Father. Father, there is such grace and such love and compassion, Lord, in having our sins forgiven and being reconciled to you, Lord. And when we are outside of you, Lord, we do not know the beauty of this salvation, Lord. But we ask that you would call us unto yourself, Father, and that you would save us for your name's sake, we pray, Father. And for the sake of our Lord Christ Jesus, May we live in Christ, for Christ, Father, by his blessings. Father, for his covering, there is security and provision, Father. And that is what this nation needs, Lord, right now, is security and provision. And so, Father, may this blessing be upon us at this time. May we know you, Father and know the purpose you have for our life. 
And may we live, Father, according to your word. And may we find, Father, a home with you. And I pray all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, with all honour and gratitude to him. Amen. Hello. We have been looking at living in the presence of God. Now, one of the titles that is given to Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And... I believe that we are all carriers of the presence of God and the early church did this you know they continually gossip in the gospel you know they became known as Christians or little Christ you know they were such carriers of the presence of God and we're learning this we're learning how to carry the presence of God in this shaking world that we're living in right now uh, last week we looked at entering the presence of God and we saw that entering the presence of God was a work of God's grace, a work of his sacrifice and it was all him and all we had to do was believe in it and trust in it, hold on to it and we could enter into the presence of God. We realised that we were not saved simply from something but we were saved to something. We were saved to someone. We were saved to the presence of God. All that it means to be a Christian is that we have been brought near. We have come into a loving relationship with our Creator, with the Father. And so today we are not looking at entering the presence of God, but we are looking at staying in the presence of God, or as our Bible is going to put it, it's saying abiding in the presence of God. And so to do that, we're going to look at a fairly well-known verse, and that's in John chapter 15, we're going to read from verse 1 to 11, and it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and he and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. There are four things that I want to look at in, from this passage of scripture in regards to abiding. And one of the things, the first thing I want to look at is some of the presumption we have around abiding. I want to look at some of the despair that comes from like verses like he's going to prune us or he'd cut us away. You know, what's that about? I also want to look at how fruitful we can be when we abide in the presence of God. And I want to also finally look at uh, getting prayers answered through abiding in the presence of God. So we are looking at the presumption. There is a presumption that if I'm abiding in the presence of God, nothing really bad can ever happen to me. You know, uh, this, surely, you know, if I'm really in there, no, no troubles can come my way. Well, let me put it like this. In pre-marriage counselling, one of the things that we're looking at, we're trying to uh, um, get the couples to uh, talk about their expectations, what they, how they see their future together. And one of the aspects of that is, are they anticipating any form of hardship to come? Because we know that even in the best of marriages, you know, there are difficult roads ahead. You know, lots of ups, sure, but there's also some difficulties, you know, that come along the way. And so much so that even in those old vows that we used to say before, we got, uh, you know, clever and started making up our own vows. 
We used to say for better, for worse. We used to say for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Because we wanted, we wanted people to know, one of the couples to know that, hey, there's going to be some great ups. There's going to be really good moments, but there's also going to be some low moments in your life. And the power, the, the wonderful thing about marriage is what we are actually declaring in marriage is that we're saying no matter what comes our way, no matter the trials, no matter the difficulties, there is no better person than I'll, that I would rather be with. There is no one else I'd rather be with but you. I am, I am dedicating my life to you because with you we can get through everything thick and thin together. And that is what it's like abiding in the presence of God. We're saying we know that when we're abiding in the presence of God, difficulties can still come our way. But the, the thing is, we know who we are with and who we are with makes it all worthwhile and makes it all possible to endure all things. It is powerful. And I think it also, it takes us out of this sort of sloppy or watery sort of view of what it means to live in the presence of God. It is, it is not, uh, you know, something that's just airy-fairy, but it's really something that is quite concrete and, and something that is uh, really vivid, I think. The Bible is the most comprehensive book, I think, on hardship. You know, it, it lays out all the details of suffering, of difficulties, you know, if we were to write the Bible, I'm sure we would leave out a lot of these details, but no, the Bible just lays it all out. And it, and it is also at the same time a really sympathetic book to those who go through troubles. Um, it is very realistic. It, it, gives, it shows us good characters, people who, um, as far as we can tell, have done nothing wrong, nothing to deserve it, but they went through troubles. And even its central character, the hero of the story, it goes through the most gruesome of suffering. He suffers the most. He suffers for all. You know, Jesus Christ, of course. You know, he goes through the most amount of suffering. And he is the epitome of someone who spends his time in the presence of God, isn't he? The Apostle Paul also uh, gives us this insight in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 3. He says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. So, He's even going this step further because we think that we can think sometimes, sometimes it's a lot more subtle for us. It, it's more comes like, I know there's going to be hardships. I can accept that, but I can never talk about them. That's not what a strong Christian does. That's not a, someone who is abiding in the presence. They don't talk about it. They don't confess it, you know. No, but he acknowledges it. He says, I was with you in weakness and fear and in trouble. You know, he, again, another person who knew the presence of God, abided in the presence of God. He even says in one place that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. He knows that uh, hardships and abiding, they can coexist. And it is the fact that God is with us that can take us through. He calls it the fellowship of his sufferings. It's God with us that takes us uh, through those hardships. Jesus too never... Uh, you know, goes part, never hides over, never glosses over the, the fact of difficulties. In verse 18 and verse 20 of this same chapter, he says, they hated me. And guess what? If you abide in me, you're going to be hated. You know, if you, if they persecuted me, guess what? If you abide in me, there's a good chance you're going to be persecuted also. So this, this mindset, uh, of suffering and abiding um, it, it, it is brought together well this this idea of suffering and abiding are brought together in the bible context and there and it really is a realistic approach to it uh, we're not hiding from it we're not saying it doesn't exist we're not living in some magical world that if we just don't acknowledge it we don't uh, address it then you know it just goes away no it is very real it says suffering is there but the presence of God in verse 2 I think it even complicates things a bit more because it says that God the father the gardener 
is at, he's, he's in the business of this, you know, difficulty. <laughs> he's in amongst it all. He's there pruning. He's there cutting, you know. And this leads us on to our second point, you know, this despair that comes when we read 50, uh, chapter 15, verse 2. It says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Or some translations say, he cuts away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You know, we think, we can sometimes think, you know, am I being fruitful enough? You know, will I be cut off? You know, will God, will God, you know, come along and, and do this to my life? Will I be cut off from his presence? Because I'm not, I'm not living up, I'm not meeting the mark, I'm not filling in the quota, you know. Well, I want us to discard some of this despair today because I want us to notice who the gardener is or who is inspecting the fruit. It says the father. He is the gardener and he is inspecting the fruit. Now there is uh, I think one translated translation that I found that translates this passage to mean not cut away but to lift up you know to pick it up off the floor and give it an opportunity to grow. And I think this is, this is rather obvious. This is rather saying to us exactly what we know. We know that every gardener, every gardener will give their branches, give their trees the best opportunity to grow. Why would they do that? Because it's in their best interest. You know, It is in their best interest to make every branch fruitful to give it the best chance to pick it up to make sure that it is growing and healthy and strong and and it has sunlight has fertilizer has water you know it that is in the gardener's best interest and i te- and i can tell you today that god is much the same god is looking over your life and he wants to give you the best opportunities to grow he is not quick to cut people off he is not quick to get rid of branches no he wants to give every branch the most, the best opportunity to grow and develop. That is his life. He, that is his uh, purpose uh, for us. But having said all of that, I think that we cannot um, domesticate God. We cannot uh, have such a view of God that we get rid of um, the fact that he's able to judge and he is... You know, the gardener is the only one that can cut the branches, isn't it? You know, and God has to have that position. The Father has to have that position in our life. And so we can't just simply get rid of those portions of Scripture. But I think God definitely does not want us to be worried about that. He does not want us to be filled with despair. He doesn't want us to be overcome by these facts that God is a judge because we... Because the, the thing is, we are in Christ. And the other reason why I know that God doesn't want us to be worried about it is because in verse 11, Jesus tells us that these things I have spoken to you, that your joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. You know, the whole purpose of this passage of scripture is an encouragement. He's trying to give us good news. He's trying to fill us with cheer. And at the same time, that cheer does not come by simply glossing over the uncomfortable truths. It, it, the, the joyfulness is not because we just don't confront those things. No, the joyfulness comes because, like we read verse 6 for instance. It says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. You know, we... We do not get cheerful by reading that verse, but we do not get cheerful by ignoring that verse either. We get cheerful, we get the joy, because we realise the thing that stops me from being withered and cast out and put into the fire is that I abide in Him. It's because I am welcomed into this relationship with God. This is the gospel message. It is the salvation from judgment, from uh, from being cut off it is it is reconnecting it is that relationship that makes the gospel the good news and causes us to have cheer we see what we have been saved from and we see what we have been saved to 
But this picture, you know, has to, one of the main features of this picture is to show us how fruitful we become, you know, from being connected to the vine. And in verse five, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. So what are we talking about? This fruit, what, what, is, what is the fruit we're talking about? Well, one of the easiest um, sort of verses that come to mind, obviously, is Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 22, where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, we're looking at those... Uh, all of those attributes of love really we could round them all up and say the fruit of the spirit is love because you know all the rest of them are sort of pictures parts of love in a sense and so but could I say this uh, clarified a bit more like this is that fruit is is not so much for the tree as it is an advantage for those outside of the tree isn't it it's it's an advantage for those around us you know all around us uh, all of, you know, if we were a tree, the, the people around us get to enjoy the fruit. They're the ones that benefit from the fruit. So to be fruitful means that our lives become such, so, so much so um, fruitful that they are a benefit. You know, our lives benefit. They're a, they uplift the lives of those around us. They bring this sweetness to life to those around us that's what it means to be fruitful but I want us to point out a, a two things about this being fruitful that come from this verse I think and one is well not this verse but the passage in as a whole is that the, being connected to God being connected to the vine it's always intentional you know we we're not passively connected to God but we are intentionally connected to God and we find that in verse 6 and 7 they both start with if you know if anyone abides in me or if anyone does not abide in me you know we we see that there is a, a in this picture somehow the branches have a choice whether they are connected to the vine or not and this is how our lives are there's an intentionalness in, uh, there is something an activeness that on our part that we play in being connected to God. For instance, if I stand <clears throat> in the sun long enough, that sun light changes me, doesn't it? You know, that it, it causes my skin to change, it cha causes my temperature to change, you know, just simply by being in the sun. Um, if I go in the water, you know, the same thing, a similar thing happens, you know, I, my temperature changes and my skin changes, you know, I become wet, I become clean, hopefully, or I become, at least, you know, if I stay there long enough, I get all wrinkly in the water, you know, there is, but there is something intentional about that, isn't it? I've got to remain in it. I, I have this choice to stay in there or to retreat from that place. And that's what it's like with God. I have to be active. And in being active in it, there is also an energy source. There is something that flows to me. I want to look at, firstly, in verse 1, it says, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Now, what's that saying? It's saying that there have been other vines, but now I am the true vine. And in the Old Testament... Israel, old Israel, Bible Israel is talked about as being a vine. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, I am the true vine. So what does that say for us? It says that simply by being an Israelite in, in Bible times, simply by being um, that nationality um, does not guarantee you a spot in this vine. No, everyone needs to come in by faith. Everyone has a choice to play. You, there is no passive entrance into God. Everyone needs to respond to God through faith. That is the only way that we come to God. And can I say this? This is the only way we remain in God. It is faith. It is an active 
active faith, an active choice day by day. I'm going to return to the presence of God. I'm, I'm, I'm staying there. Um, having said that, you know, there's this intention. Uh, the branches intentionally stay connected to the vine. They become filled with the life of the vine. But having said that, there is something organic about this growth. You know, as I stay connected to the vine, you know, I'm active in that. But what happens to me, what happens to my life, what happens to my fruitfulness, what happens to my effect on those around me is rather organic. You know, my life is all fixated, should be fixated on staying connected to him. But then the, the offspring of that, see, we sometimes get it the other way around. We're trying to produce the fruit. You know, we're focused on, you know, I don't have joy in my life. So how do I get joy? Well, he already tells us how you get joy, how you get peace, how you get this love. It is by staying connected to the vine. It's not me striving at trying to get those things by my own will. No, it's by me remaining in the presence of God, remaining, um, looking at him. Uh, dwelling upon him that my life becomes like it's like standing in the sun you know <laughs> there is I'm intentional about staying in the sun but the energy source is not my own the thing that changes me is not my own sunlight there is a there is something else that changes me you know if I stay around someone long enough if I live around someone long enough I start to you know, even talk like them, I start to sound like them, I start to even look like them in some ways, you know, because I'm, I'm being around them, it has a knock-on effect on me, and that is what it's like in being in God, and being fruitful in Him, it is all based around how connected we are, how strong is this relationship that I have with Him, how strong is this fellowship that I have with Him, how strong is my communication I have with Him, these things have a knock-on effect uh, to us. Finally, we're going to look at verse 7. And in verse 7 it says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. These, uh, he's not saying, clearly it's not saying, simply by remembering scripture, we will get whatever we want. No, he's saying these words, abiding in us, uh, changing our life. And I want to show you that in a moment. But these, uh, the Word of God actually changes our life, uh, changes our will, changes our desires, so that the things that we're asking for are actually the things that God wants to achieve in our lives also. In John chapter 5, verse 39, uh, Jesus addresses the Jewish leaders and he says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that which testify of me. See, <clears throat> he's saying, you're looking into the scriptures because you think you can get something out of it. You know, you know sometimes we read the scriptures in a sense that, you know, I, I need to read this to, to uh, um, you know, if I just read these verses each day, then I'm going to have a good life, and I'm going to have a successful day, and it becomes like really religious and rigid you know read the verse and then I, it means i have a good day we treat it really actually superstitiously whereas jesus is saying these are they which testify me all of scripture is actually revealing jesus it's pointing to a relationship it's pointing to a person it's talking about christ himself see when we depersonalize the scriptures we end up with some abstraction you know it's just this strange interpretation but whenever we see that the scriptures are pointing towards who he is, uh, we that word becomes something of a revelation to us. It becomes something that is alive to us. With me and my wife, you know, I'm sort of every day, and she's doing the same to me, we're reading the pages of each other's life, aren't we? We're, we're learning about each other. We're talking to each other. We're discovering more about each other. Now, if, if I just... If we live just by lists of things to do, you know, do this and do that, and you know, that is not a good marriage, is it? No, marriage is much more than just lists and to-do lists and this and that. 
you know, information alone. It is about this fellowship. It is about us having conversations, getting to know each other, learning about each other. And the more and more we do that, the more and more we abide and the more and more we become in sync with each other and we actually start to desire the same things. We're pursuing the same goals in life. We're, we're heading in the same direction in life. And that's how we are with God also. The Word of God is meant to align us with the, with the ways of God, with the desires of God, um, so that our, the things that we're asking for in prayer are things that he wants to achieve in this world anyway. So God is not so much committed to, <laughs> he's not obligated to fulfill our, what we want, but he is committed to fulfilling his word. The scripture says he will, the word of God would not return to him void of fulfillment. No, God always is accomplishing his word. So therefore, all of my prayers are not so much me trying to convince God, but it's me partnering with God. It is me recognizing that when I'm praying, I'm praying in line with God. I'm praying in partnership with God. He is praying through me. So what about my needs? What about, you're sitting there going, well, that's great, but I have needs. I'm, I'm trying to, I want God to answer prayers in my life. I need healing. I need a breakthrough. I need finances. I need these things in my life. So how do I, how do I, how do I pray that? Well, it just goes, to, it just, um, the amazing thing is this, is that God wants those same things for your life. It turns out in scripture, God is, laying out principles he's used taking the word of god to uh, bring about good things in your life healings breakthroughs uh, financial blessing he wants to achieve those things in your life i love this story in the bible where the leper comes to jesus and says lord if you are willing you can heal me and jesus says touches him touches the leper and says i am willing and I think that is the biggest breakthrough, the biggest thing that we can hold on to right now is that God is willing to do those things. See, the Word of God is a personal uh, uh, response from God showing us that He is willing, you know, showing us that He wants to do great things in your life. So therefore, I am not begging God in my prayer but when I come with the words of God and those words are abiding in my heart, it is a personal note from God showing me that the things I am praying, I am praying in accordance with the things that God wants to achieve in me and God wants to achieve in this world and God wants to achieve in my neighbourhood, in my circumstances. And so this is how abiding and getting answers to prayer work together. I thank God for this uh, verses, this verse that we've read, this, this passage of scripture showing us the essential nature of abiding in the presence of God and how it applies to so much of our life.